Let's look at July 2022 environment. Now, exceptional warming of Barrett Sea and Atlantification. According to a study, the region around the northern Barrett Sea in the Arctic region has been warming at an alarming high rate. Now, let's look at the map of the Barrett Sea. Uh, it is basically in the Arctic, re Arctic Ocean region. On the northwest is the Svalbard, Norway Islands. To its southeast lies Russia. On the east is the Kara Sea. On the south lies Norway. Finland and Russia, that is Kola Peninsula. And there is White Sea, Norwegian Sea, Greenland Sea and Franz Josef Land of Russia. Now let's see what Atlantification is. Streams of warmer water from Atlantic Ocean flow into the Arctic region at Barrett Sea. The warmer, saltier Atlantic water is usually fairly deep under the more buoyant Arctic water at the surface. Lately, the Atlantic water has been creeping up. The heat in the Atlantic water is keeping to ice is helping to keep ice from forming and melting existing sea ice from below. This process is called Atlantification. Hence, the ice in the Arctic is now getting hit both from the top by a warming atmosphere and at the bottom by a warming ocean due to Atlantification. Now, according to the study, the region around the northern Barent has been warming at 2 to 2.5 times the average warming rate of Arctic region and 7 to 7, 5 to 7 times the warming in the rest of the world. The reason for this is global climate change. Now, the impact of warming Arctic ice is that the rapid warming of Arctic region has made the local weather more erratic, such as the first recorded rainfall at the summit station of Greenland in August 2021. Now, warming of the Barents Sea also led to an extreme snowfall event often dubbed as Beast from the East across the most of Europe in 2018. In India, Arctic warming has been linked to the swelling heat waves across most of the Northwest, Central and some parts of the Eastern India in 2022. Now let's look at the heating up of rivers due to climate change. According to a study, climate change may turn India's rivers into hostile environment for aquatic life by 2070 or 2100. So the study has been conducted in seven Indian basins that is Ganga, Narmada, Kaveri, Sabarmati, Tungbhadra, Musi and Godavari river basin. They have used machine learning to predict the historical present and future river water temperatures for each of the basins. This was then converted to dissolved oxygen levels. Now one important thing is to note that the riverine species cannot survive for long when the level of dissolved oxygen drops below 4 to 5 milligrams of oxygen per litre of water. Now the Study predicts that the dissolved oxygen levels can drop to 7.3 mg of oxygen per liter from the present 7.9 mg of oxygen per liter. This may impact aquatic life. Now let's move on to the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. The meeting of the working group on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework failed to achieve much. The meeting was supposed to reach a consensus on the text of the framework which is to be finalized at the 15th COP of the Convention on Biological Diversity that is CBD. Now about the post-2020 Global Diversity Framework. The aim of the framework is to implement broad-based action to bring about a transformation in society's relationship with biodiversity ensuring that by 2050 the shared vision of living in harmony with nature is fulfilled. Now, the framework is built around a theory of change which recognizes that the urgent policy action globally, regionally and nationally is required to transform economic, social and financial models. Now, four goals are to be achieved under the framework by 2050. That is to halt the extinction of the decline of biodiversity, enhance and retain nature's service to humans by conserving, ensuring fair and equitable benefits to all from the use of genetic resources, close the gap between available financial and other means by implementation and those necessary to achieve the 2050 vision. Now let's look at the 2030 action targets. The framework has 21 action oriented targets for urgent action over the decade to 2030, which includes to bring at least 30% of the land and sea under world's protected areas, a 50% or greater reduction in the rate of introduction of invasive alien species, and also to control or eradicate eradication of such species to eliminate or reduce their impact, reducing nutrients lost to the environment by at least half pesticides by at least two-thirds and eliminating the discharge of plastic waste. It also wants to increase the nature-based con contributions to global climate change mitigation efforts of at least 10 gigatons carbon dioxide equivalents per year and all mitigation and adaptation efforts avoid negative impacts on biodiversity. Now let's look at the sustainable use of wildlife species, which is a report by IPEPS, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services has released a report titled Sustainable Use of Wildlife Species. 
The report offers insight into the sustainable use of wild species. It reminds the global community how human beings are interdependent with all living beings. The report emphasizes the importance to conserve biodiversity by stopping overexploitation and protecting habitats. Now the key findings of the report have been there is a dependence on wildlife species. That is 70% of the world's poor are directly dependent on wild species. 20% rely on wild plants, algae, fungi for their food and income. Approximately 2.4 billion people rely on food, fuel food for cooking. It wants to encourage non-extractive uses such as tourism. Now there is a cultural significance. Now the threats faced by wildlife species are overexploitation, climate change, pollution, deforestation, which are pushing 1 million species towards extinction. Now the earth is on its way to losing 12% of its wild tree species, over 1000 wild mammal species and 450 species of sharks and rays among other irreplaceable harms. Now the suggestions given by the report is that integration of diverse value systems, equitable distributions of cost and benefit, changes in cultural norms and social values, and effective institution and governance systems can facilitate sustainable use of wild species. Now reducing illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, suppressing harmful financial subsidies, supporting small-scale fisheries, adapting to changes in ocean productivity due to climate change, proactively proactively creating effective transboundary institutions. Now let's move on to the impact of loss of biodiversity on sovereign credit ratings. Now according to a study by British economist, loss of biodiversity will downgrade the sovereign credit rating of several countries including India, increasing the risk of bankruptcy. Now sovereign credit ratings are an independent assessment that determines the credit worthiness of a country. It can give investors insight into the level of risk associated with investing in the debt of a particular country including including any political risk. What is the link between sovereign credit rating and biodiversity loss? Biodiversity loss will lead to partial ecosystem collapse such as in fisheries, tropical timber production and wild pollination. This will have a deep impact on economic output. Now there will be an impact on ordinary people as well. That is, as, na as nature lose, loss reduces economic performance, it will become harder for countries to service their debts, straining government budgets and forcing them to raise taxes cut spendings and increase inflation. This will have grim consequences for ordinary people as well. Now let's look at the Beti Varda River Interlinking Project. Environmental groups in Karnataka have criticized the Beti Varda Interlinking Project, calling it unscientific and needless. Now let's talk about the Beti Varda Interlinking Project. The project was envisaged in 1992 to supply drinking water. The plan aims to link Beti, which is a river flowing west into the Arabian Sea, with the Varda, which is a tributary of Tungabhadra, which flows into Krishna River, which in turn flows into Bay of Bengal. Now, the massive dam is to be erected in the Gadgar district. A second dam will be built on the Pathanhal River in Siri, Uttarakhanda, Kanda River district. Uttarakhanda district. Both dams will take water to Varda while tunnels. The project has envisaged taking water from water surplus Siri, Yellurupa region of Uttarakhanda districts to the arid Raichur, Gadak, Kopal districts. Now, the opposition by activists is that it is difficult to redirect the river as a westward flowing river is to be redirected to a eastward flowing river. Now both the rivers are rain fed, which is to say that they do not flow all the year. Now there will be environmental impact of this project, that is to say that 500 acre acres of forest will be lost. Moreover, the Beti Valley has been designated as an active biodiversity zone by IUCN. The Beti Vada River also life are lifelines for thousands of farmers in the Malinadu region and foothills of Western Ghats in addition to fishing communities along the coast. Now let's move on to National Air Quality Resource Framework of India, that is NARFI. A brainstorming workshop was organized recently to kickstart the national mission on National Air Quality Resource Framework of India. The National Air Quality Resource Framework of India has been developed by the National Institute of Advanced Sciences, Bengaluru, with support from the Office of Principal Scientific Advisor. The framework is an information mechanism to help decision makers in the government, municipality, startups and in the private sector to address air pollution issues in different climatic zones of India. As part of the framework, 
Short term basic training modules tailored for different groups such as active ground level staff in government establishments, implementers, media, policy makers would be provided. All of this can enrich communication and enhance general awareness leading to self mitigations. Now the module is to evolve around the following five modules, which is emission inventory, airshed and mitigation, impact on human health and agriculture, integrated monitoring, forecasting and advisory framework, outreach, social dimension, transition strategy and policy, solutions, public industry partnerships, subtle, subtle burning and new technologies. Now let's move on to CAQM policy to mitigate air pollution in Delhi NCR. The Commission on Air Quality Management has formulated a policy to abate air pollution in Delhi NCR. Now the Supreme Court of India in Aditya Dubey versus Union of India and others has directed CAQM to find a permanent solution to the air pollution problem which occurs every year in Delhi NCR. Now the policy has suggested short term that is up to one year, medium term that is up to one to three years and long term which is three to five years actions. Some of the actions include widespread access to affordable clean fuels and technology in industry, transport and households. Mobility transition include mass transits, electrification of vehicles, building walking and cycling infrastructure and reducing personal vehicle usage etc. Circular economy for material recovery from waste to prevent it dumping and burning. Dust management from construction and demolition activities, roads, right of way and open areas with appropriate technology, infrastructure and greening measures. Strict time bound implementation, improved monitoring and compliance are some of the recommendations. Let's move on to proposed amendments to Environment Protection Act 1986. The Ministry of Environment has proposed to amend the Environment Protection Act 1986 and decriminalize certain offences. Now, the current penal provision under the EPA 1986 is that it was enacted under Article 253 of the Indian Constitution, which provides for the enactment of legislation for giving effect to international agreements. Now, the Act establishes the framework for, for implementing long-term requirements of environmental safety. It lays down a system of speedy and it adequate response to situations threatening the environment. In case of non-compliance or contravention of the current provisions of EPA, the violators can be punished with imprisonment up to 5 years or a fine or both of 1 lakh rupees. Now in case of contravenance, contravenance of such violations, an additional fine of up to 5000 for every day can be levied. If the violation continues beyond a period of 1 year after the date of conviction, the offender can be punished with imprisonment for a term of which may extend up to seven years. Now the proposed changes is that the government wants to replace imprisonment with monetary penalty for less severe contraventions under the EPA. However, severe violations of EPA which lead to grievous injury or loss of life shall be covered under the provisions of IPC. It has also proposed the creation of environmental protection fund in which the amount of penalty be remitted.